Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the studio. The content has gotten a little one-tracked lately, for this I do apologize. Our regular variety will be returning soon once I finish some important work. For now, let's try to get through the last two episodes of Chronos All Devouring. We are developing some new sections today, sculpting on top of raw armature wire again, and there are a few things to be aware of when doing so. The clay really needs to stick to the armature wire, so as you can see, don't slap these first pieces of clay on expecting them to look like something right away. This is much more important in a thinner section, like the arms, because they can dry out really fast. If the clay is loosely applied and they dry out, and I water them again so they become moist and workable, the clay won't stick as well anymore. The clay can begin to rotate on the armature wire, which is very annoying as you apply clay and the clay previously applied moves around on you as well. Or the clay can simply crumble and turn to mud and fall off the armature. Now this is much less likely to happen if there is no air inside the clay, so applying it thoroughly makes a difference here. Calipers are used to determine where I'm going to place the wrist. I know that in general the length from shoulder down to the elbow is the same as the length from the elbow to the knuckles of the hand. Knowing this, I can make a pretty decent estimate of where the wrist needs to be. Generalized proportional rules are going to be fine here. First and foremost, the arms must function decently with the body. Having already established the elbow in a previous episode, I can use the shoulder to the elbow as a truth and establish the length of the forearm that way. To determine the length of the upper arm, I made sure the elbow would reach down to about the bottom of the ribcage, which tends to be a decent place to start at least. Generalized proportional rules is not something I would use at all if I had a model to work from, but in this scenario they come in really handy, and it's good to know a few of them for sure. You've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. Draw first, then reinforce the drawing with clay. When blocking in a new section of a sculpture, it's always a good idea to cover it a bit with clay, cover the armature with clay, which we spoke about earlier, then begin to draw on the surface. I like to draw first and then apply clay, thinking of contour while staying within my drawing. I find that especially in narrow sections, where there is a, not a lot of clay to be added, it can be a little tricky to convert contours that are just moving down the middle of the arm into contours that move in space. It's easier when there's more width to work with, like in the body, to do this. By drawing first, I begin to establish the major forms. Once I think the drawing is in a decent place, I apply clay, and the clay applied reinforces both the drawing and the forms the drawing represents, and it turns into contours as well. However, the focus is on contours and what they look like, as this is one of the most, or more, important things to get right early on. Things like volume, transitions, those are not even considerations to me at this stage, I'm not even thinking about it. Shape design and contours are my main priorities to begin with. I'm not even so concerned with hyper-accuracy or anything like that. I just wanted to head in the right direction to begin with. Anything that's more right than wrong, I'll roll with and consider a success. Thinking and working this way allows me to continually push the work forwards and improve it. I've recently been asked a few times about work drying out and how to take care of it and since it's getting hot here in Florence, students are starting to struggle and be confronted more and more with this issue. The answer is simple yet difficult. Know your material and take care of it. Water-based clay is made malleable by water and water evaporates. Replacing the evaporated water by spraying the sculpture is the solution to the clay drying out. However, it can be tricky as you can spray too much, and you can, of course, spray too little. 
There's no proper way, there's no proper formula of knowing exactly how dry or wet the clay needs to be, and it's up to personal taste as well how wet or dry you'd like the clay to be. I prefer a fairly dry clay as it helps with control. The clay that I apply is fairly soft, however, it's much fresher so that it lays down nice and fast. Drier clay is more easily tooled and doesn't move around when you apply fresh clay to it, so that's why I do it this way. In the beginning, my work is quite soft, as I need it to be flexible, so I can change things, move things around. As we go further and further into the process, the clay gets firmer and firmer, so I have more control as I transition into finer and finer work. For the arm of the little female figure, I needed to figure out the proportions of the whole arm in this episode. It's pretty easy since I have the body, however. An arm hanging by the side of a standing body tends to reach down to around the middle of the thigh. The tip of the fingers reach down to about the middle of the thigh. The elbow tends to rest around the bottom of the ribcage, and from the shoulder to elbow is the same distance as from the elbow down to the knuckles of the hand. The fingers are about as long as the palm of the hand, so the fingertip to the knuckle should be about as long as the knuckle to the wrist. Now these are of course all general rules of thumb, and often enough what gives someone distinct individual characteristics are slight deviations from one or several of these averages. When sculpting any of the limbs, be it leg or arm, there are a few constants that you should consider and attempt to make highlight features in my opinion. One of these is thick to thin. The arms and the legs thus undulate in and out. They are not constantly going from thicker at the top to thinner at the bottom, but in general, limbs should have a taper to them. Overall, the arms move from thicker towards thinner. Offset high points is another one. This means that in contour you should not have the high points directly across from each other. Not only is this how the limbs appear naturally to us, but considering this means we establish rhythm. There is gesture in the overall when it comes to your work. That's usually established by placing bony landmarks on top of each other in a certain fashion and connecting them with the center line representing the spine. The bony landmarks can be arranged in a number of ways, creating any number of gestures. There's no formula for what makes good gesture here. At the same time, each individual section of your sculpture can have rhythm or gesture as well. In the limbs, this is established by offsetting the high points on forms on either side of the contour. The same thing is true for low points in the contour. By low points, I mean a negative angle break. An angle break that heads inwards into the body, or the arms, in this case, instead of outwards. The low points in the contour should be considered in a similar fashion as the high points. They should be offset from each other. In addition, the low points or negative angle breaks, they are usually the same, signify a passage of form. A passage of form means that the contour is made up by one form until we get to the negative angle break, where it is taken over by another form. So as an example for those anatomically inclined out there, I have the contour from the inside of the elbow towards the thumb side of the hand being taken up by the brachioradialis before the extensor carpi radialis brevis takes over at around the two-thirds mark. And that's headed from the inside of the elbow towards the thumb side of the hand. Now don't worry too much if that didn't make any sense to you. I don't know a lot of these names off the top of my head either, so I had to look them up. But you don't need to know every name of every muscle if you have reference to work from, so keep that in mind. Reference is really important. Just knowing that a negative angle break signifies a passage of form doesn't free you from the reference, by the way, but allows you to make proper sense of your reference especially if the reference is a two-dimensional photograph, and it also allows you to anticipate what needs to happen, which will speed up your process. So why is all of this of importance to us? 
it goes beyond making a sculpture that looks anatomically correct or accurate to some reference. These concepts, when applied, do help us make these things come true, but it's not why it's important, or it's not the only reason why. It's important because it moves the eye. Rhythm or gesture moves the eye, and this is the way of making sure we can maintain a sense of solidity and a sense of rhythm at the same time. For someone with no knowledge of the tools that we fill our work with, or the concepts that we use to create our work, it just seems to make somewhat sense anatomically, and they can't help but enjoy the work. Their eye moves around the piece. If they appreciate the subject matter and the style it's sculpted in, I suppose, those things obviously matter as well. But somebody looking at your work don't need to know that their eye is being moved, for example. The fact that they don't know probably just helps making sure that it happens. When I look at work, I sometimes look for these things, especially if I like the work and I analyze these things and try to see why I like it. Usually there is something to be learned. When you're sculpting two arms, an often overlooked aspect is the fact that they need to be pretty much the same length. Now this sounds pretty silly and simple, but it's easy to overlook. Measure twice and make sure that you lay down some landmarks or borders to work within. I like to work out my heights and lengths to begin with and use those as my boundaries. Then I'll leave the widths fairly flexible and play around with them until I find out where they need to be. Heights or lengths are unforgiving. Widths are forgiving. So make sure you play to that advantage whenever it makes sense to do so. Let's take a quick second to talk about how you can support the channel. Subscribing and liking the video is of great help, of course. If you would like to get something in return for your support, however, head over to my Patreon page. On Patreon, you can watch exclusive content, like the Beginner's Guide to Figure Sculpture, which we just completed, and the Portrait series, which we have just started, where I will show you everything you need to know about sculpting portraiture. You can also get personal feedback on your own work from me, or anything you might need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, there's a link in the description below. So as a general rule of thumb, offset high points move the eye of the beholder around your work. Stronger offsets move the eyes faster. The body is symmetrical, but because of pose, the high points on either side of the contour of the body become offset. However, they are a lot less offset than in the limbs, so the eyes slow down as they travel throughout the body. In the portrait, we have a lot of symmetry. People watching your work will want to look there to begin with anyways because it's faces that we look for when we communicate so we tend to our eye tend to go there automatically but the fact that there is a lot of symmetry there slows the eye down even more and draws a lot of attention so this is but a few of the tools that a sculptor might use in order to move the eye and direct the attention of the beholder Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, consider liking it and subscribing to the channel for more videos. I put out a new video every Thursday, so stay tuned for next week. If you want to support the channel, visit the link to my Patreon page in the description below the video to learn how. Until then, stay creative, and I hope to see you in the next one.